Hello and uh, welcome uh, back to the course. So we're looking at uh, harmonic functions and in particular the Dirichlet problem and solving the Dirichlet problem in a disk using the Poisson kernel in the disk. So this is subsection 7.2.1 in the book and you can get the book in the link in the description. You can get a PDF or buy a paperback if you want. All right, so what are we looking at? We're looking at the Dirichlet problem. What is the Dirichlet problem? Start with some open set u. Start with a continuous function f on the boundary of u, just on the boundary. And we want to find a continuous g uh, on the closure, so including the boundary, on u and including the boundary, that is harmonic inside u. And such that if I look at the boundary value, so if I restrict g to the boundary, I get f. So that's the Dirichlet problem. Uh, you know, start with this data, uh, and then solve. Basically, solve the uh, uh, Laplacian equals uh, Laplacian of uh, g equals zero with a given boundary at the Laplace equation. Right, that's what it is. So it's solvable for many u, but not not all u. Um, you can just start with absolutely any u and any boundary data, but as long as the u has nice enough boundary, this is actually solvable. Uh, but we can easily show that it's unique if it exists, well, as long as the domain is going to be bounded. So suppose that we have a bounded domain u, and suppose that we have uh, two functions that are continuous on the closure, and they're harmonic on u, and they're equal on the boundary, then they're equal inside. Uh, <clears throat> and this is the maximum principle. Uh, it's the second version, the one where the maximum is must be attained on the boundary, and maximum and a minimum. So you look at just uh, uh, f minus g. All right? That's that's going to be harmonic as well, and um, it's going to be zero on the boundary. All right. So on an unbounded domain. Uh, solution, if it exists, might not be unique. So, for example, uh, on the upper half plane, uh, you know, it's it's a fairly simple exercise to show two distinct uh, distinct uh, harmonic functions with the same uh, boundary value on the real line, right? So they're going to be the same on the real line, but they're going to be they're going to be different. Uh, in the upper half plane. And don't think too hard. Think of the, the simplest possible harmonic functions that you can think of. All right. So how are we going to solve this? We're going to solve this by integrating against the kernel, the so-called uh, Poisson kernel. Um, so for the unit disk, the kernel is the following. So we're going to... Uh, just kind of traditional way of writing it, uh, piece of r theta. Uh, we're really thinking of it as a function of r e to the i theta, where r is uh, so, so basically in, in polar coordinates. Uh, so, uh, you know, r is the distance from the center and theta is the argument. So this is just the formula, and uh, sometimes that formula is useful. Sometimes this formula is useful. Um, now, if, if we look at this second formula for the kernel, and again, that's just a little bit of algebra to go from one to the other, uh, then if you think of z, if you write uh, r e to the i theta as z, you get this, you know, perhaps nicer, even nicer version of this formula. I mean, it's the, still the second version of the formula, right? So that's that's the that's the Poisson kernel. And here's the, here's the graph of it. Uh, so it's, blows up over here, of course, where there's this pole uh, on my z, so uh, at uh, z equals 1, it would blow up. That's, that's, that's why it's uh, blowing up over here. But that's, that's, that's how the graph looks. Uh, all right, so let's prove some, uh, uh, you know, some, some basic facts about the Poisson kernel. So first, it's going to be always positive, right? And, you know, whatever I'm writing is the, the r is just going to be uh, between 0 and 1, right? All theta, although usually we'll have uh, theta between minus pi and pi, but again, it's 
periodic, so it doesn't really matter, right? But R should stay within uh, uh, within uh, zero and one. Uh, then <clears throat> if we integrate um, for any fixed R, we integrate from minus pi to pi, uh, we get one. So we're thinking of it, uh, uh, a lot of times we are actually thinking of the, the, the Poisson kernel as a function of theta, right, for a fixed R. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, we also, th there is this pole, right? There is this place where it, uh, where it blows up. Uh, but uh, if you stay away from this pole, you actually get uh, it. It goes to zero nicely, and you can you can see that from the uh, from the from the graph. If I if I go uh, to the boundary anywhere else, it's it goes to zero. And uh, more specifically, uh, we get this uh, this following right: is that given any delta, so if we if we're gonna stay delta away from where theta is zero, so away from the uh, uh, zero angle. Uh, so if the angle is uh, in absolute value, it's it's between delta and pi, right? So uh, it's we're basically cutting out this minus delta to delta uh, interval. So as long as theta is um, is staying away from zero, uh, then we we get that the that the maximum that this thing is, right? Uh, so we're taking uh, the maximum over all these thetas. So we're thinking of this as a function of r. Then that goes to zero as r goes to one, right? So we can actually get kind of a uniformity as well. Not just going to zero, but going to zero uniformly. Uh, <clears throat> as long as we're staying away from, <laughs> we're delta away from. So for fixed any fixed delta, this works. Um, so if we think of it, this uh, you know, as I said. It's good to think of the, the Poisson kernel as a as a graph. So for different R's, so you can see that it's um, basically uh, what we're getting is for small R. That's this blue line, right? Where this uh, it's like the bigger R is this green line it goes up higher, and uh, when it's uh, uh, zero point eight five, we're getting this much taller peak, and we're getting taller and taller peaks. And that's really the way that this is going to work. We're going to integrate, it's it's going to be this approximate delta function. And so we're going to be integrating uh, our um, our function on the boundary against this. And basically we're going to be taking this, this, uh, this uh, uh, certain weighted averages of it, right? And that's actually going to, uh, this, this, this peak as it becomes Taller and taller, but still the area underneath is one. Um, it's it's basically approximating uh, for the delta function, right? So we're getting uh, we're getting better and better uh, sort of approximations as we're getting close to the boundary. And that's what we want because we want the function to be continuous up to the boundary. Now, of course, it's not just any sort of uh, approximation inside. Uh, we also want it to be harmonic, right? But that's uh, you know the fact that this is this is a tall peak. Uh, and getting taller and taller and taller, thinner and thinner, but uh, still of area one. Uh, if we're going to integrate our function against it, we're going to get uh, closer and closer to the value of the function, right? So that's going to—that's what's going to make the continuity up to the boundary, and then it's going to be uh, harmonic because the the Poisson kernel is going to be harmonic. All right. So, okay. So this this is the this is the formula, right? So first, positive. Well, that's that's uh, uh, that's kind of easy. So we have uh, uh, this is positive, right? So if I look at the top, that's positive, right? Remember that R is between uh, zero and one, and then the uh, the bottom. Well, if if we do uh, if we estimate this, like this, you know, uh, from below, right? Um, the cosines between minus one and one, right? So we get this, which is just uh, one minus r squared. That's also positive, right? So we get that uh, this thing is a positive number over a positive number, so it's positive. Now, let's look at uh, why the integral is one, right? So we, we look at why is this integral one? Well, we just write it out. Uh, and now we're going to use the second form. Write it out like this. 
that's just what it is. Um, and uh, well, let's uh, uh, let's pull the, the the real part out. We're just taking going to be taking the real part of this of this integral, right? And we've put in uh, this. Uh, uh, we, We've put in um, so we had t um, uh, the two pi here, and notice that there's a two pi i here, and I've put in the i out here, and then I multiply by r e to the i theta and divide it by it as well. Um, that's going to show up just now. That's going to give us our dz, right? And uh, so if you think about what this is, that's just the parameterization of this specific uh, integral. Right, so I have my one over z, right, and then this is the one plus z divided by one minus z, right. And I have, I'm taking the real part of that. Well, Cauchy integral formula just says, well, uh, this you know r is again less than one, so this is a smaller disk. Uh, uh, you know, this is nicely holomorphic inside the the r disk centered at zero, and so uh, we're only Looking at uh, you know this is, this is just uh, looking at the uh, value at zero of this function right so one plus zero one minus zero and we're taking the real part of that so it's one ah well that's exactly what we wanted right so Cauchy integral formula to the rescue all right so let's look at this uh, uniformity estimate uh, as uh, uh, away from zero when delta uh, when sorry uh, theta is away from zero. So um, first, by symmetry, we only need to look at uh, when theta is between delta and pi, uh, because, well, this cosine of theta. So this thing is this thing is going to be even. So um, second, uh, if we're computing the supremum, um, it's actually enough to look at uh, PR at delta because uh, uh, PR if if we start at zero and go forward uh, it's actually strictly decreasing see it on the graphs right I mean it was a peak it was going up from minus pi to zero and then it's going down from zero to pi um, and you can just see that from the uh, from the formula it's just a little bit of uh, calculus right so uh, so we have a strictly decreasing function, so we only need to look at uh, uh, the value at the beginning at, uh, point right, of this interval, which is a delta. So if we show that PR delta goes to zero as R goes to one, uh, we're showing this more complicated uh, uh, complicated limit. Right. Now, so let's look at this function. So the Poisson kernel is really the real part of that, so let's look at that function. It is continuous at one at, at r equals one. If I think of it as a function of r, right, uh, and so delta is fixed. And uh, so let's rewrite it. Let's take uh, let's take this function at one. So I've plugged in one. So that's, that's why I have one plus e to the i delta and one minus e to the i delta. Then I multiply uh, top and bottom by the complex conjugate. I'm gonna get in the bottom, I get the, well, the, uh, the module squared of this thing. And on the top, uh, if you work it out, you get uh, this, uh, which is, uh, I'm getting 2i times the real, uh, no, sorry, the imaginary part of e to the i delta, right? So if I pull the i out, I have, uh, then I have some real number here, I have some real number here. So this number, is purely imaginary. So if we take its real part, it's zero, right? So it has to go to zero, right? This the real part as r goes to uh, r goes to one. Okay. So so that proves the proposition. So that was that was rather simple. Uh, so let's let's prove the theorem. Let's 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 show that we can uh, we can solve the Dirichlet problem using the Poisson kernel. And uh, the way that we're doing it is we're integrating against the kernel. So we're integrating. We take the function f, which is defined on the uh, on the unit circle, and then we're defining this uh, uh, this this transform p f 
uh, by uh, you know at, at any point uh, inside the disk or or even on the circle. So on the circle, we just set it to the value of the function, and inside we set it to this integral, right? And we're claiming that this function, which is defined on the closed disk, is harmonic inside the disk and continuous up to the boundary. So continuous on the closure. All right. So uh, so uh, take some take some z. All right, like this. Now for a fixed uh, fixed theme, uh, uh, we we rewrite the um, the the Poisson kernel like this. Uh, well, we write this thing, right? Uh, and uh, if we're thinking of the z as r e to the i theta, right? So if we write the p r theta minus t out here, uh, so then I just uh, factor out the z out here, I get this formula. Now this is a harmonic function as a function of z, right? So for any fixed t, if I if I take this thing as a function of z, it's harmonic, well, because it's the real part of a holomorphic function, right? All right. So let's look at uh, p f at z, right? So well, it's you know we have this formula, so we write down the formula. Uh, we've rewritten the uh, Poisson kernel like this. So I'm going to put it out here. Uh, and then, so now we see that uh, not only is this harmonic, now we see that this guy is harmonic, right? Because uh, what we can now do is, you know, if, if we differentiate, right? I mean, you know, the thing just, there's the function of z. The only place where z appears is out here. So uh, if we differentiate in, in Z, if, if we take if we take a Laplacian uh, and we can pass it underneath uh, the integral here, uh, then we see that when it goes inside, it doesn't really see this. It sees this and this harmonic. So this is PF of Z is harmonic in D. Okay, so that was actually the uh, simpler uh, simpler part of this. All right, so uh, let's uh, take uh, PF and let's uh, let's uh, change variables a little bit. It's uh, it's really a convolution. So what we can do is uh, is do basically U substitution for calculus, right? Um, and get uh, write uh, the integrand like this. Basically, we're taking the theta minus t. We're putting it out here. Those are the two uh, equivalent ways of writing the convolution. Normally, you you know that would uh, mess up our our uh, limits, but these are all two pi periodic functions, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so we can just integrate over minus pi to pi. All right. So so we change basically. We, we've moved. Uh, we've taken the theta out of the uh, out of the uh, Poisson kernel. All right. So let epsilon be given. And take m to be the supremum of modulus of f. F is just a continuous function, right? So um, it has a it has a supremum, and take uh, and it's also it's a compact set the the circle, so it's uniformly continuous, right? So that means that there exists some delta such that uh, uh, when I look, so no matter what uh, what theta is. If I look uh, less than delta away from it, uh, then I have that uh, f e to the i delta minus t, so t away from delta, uh, and I subtract uh, uh, f of e to the i theta, I'm no more than epsilon over 2 away, right? Okay. Now, also, we can find a delta prime such that uh, we have... Uh, uh, this uh, this PR of T is less than you know this number. We'll see where that comes up. Uh, whenever you're sufficiently close to one, 
and uh, further from zero than delta. So this is where uh, that uh, uh, proposition that, that, that you know, as well going to zero uh, away from uh, uh, away from the origin, uh, that's where that you know part three of that proposition is being used, right? So we know that that we can do this, right? So you know we have a fixed delta now, so and the the delta prime is really for the r. How far do we need to go in the r direction, right? Uh, to get uh, you know basically get any estimate, right? I mean it's always positive. It's it's the second uh, inequality here that that we're looking at. All right, now, it is uh, the neat trick, right? If, if I have, uh, uh, you know, anything, uh, you know, really any number, right? Since this integral is one, I can just put that number inside, right? So I'm writing writing this in a kind of a stupid way, but that's going to make it possible for me to combine it with this thing. So if I look at the difference of f e to the i theta and uh, P F R e to the i theta. Uh, again, you're going to be looking at uh, these uh, these r. Uh, <clears throat> then, well, I'll just write it out. That's that's what it is, right? So this this thing allowed me to combine it as a single integral. But now I can, uh, you know, well, <laughs> going to first uh, uh, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the integral into three pieces from minus pi to minus delta from minus delta to delta, and from delta to pi. All right, and what we can do, we can deal with each one of them separately. So first, uh, let's look at this on minus pi to delta. And okay, now let's let's put the uh, the absolute value inside, right? Uh, piece of art, the, the Poisson kernel is positive, so uh, it doesn't really care. So I have uh, this guy over here. And well, this, uh, I have this bound, right? So sort of the most brute force bound for this, right? It's, you know, at most twice m. Uh, then the size of this uh, integral is uh, pi minus delta, uh, right? And I have, uh, I'm taking, I'm also using this estimate. So I'm estimating this thing by epsilon uh, 8m pi. This is, this is where you see where that uh, came out. Right, and well, if you think about it, <laughs> if you do some cancellations and sort of estimate pi minus delta from above by pi, you get uh, that this is at most uh, uh, epsilon over four. It's actually less than epsilon over four because delta is positive. Okay, so we have that this thing, this part of the integral is less than epsilon over four. Now, from delta to pi, it's exactly the same. I mean, this is. Uh, uh, it's uh, you know uh, the, the 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 p is uh, uh, you know that guy is uh, even so that doesn't really make a difference. Okay, f might be different, uh, but uh, but the only thing that we're using about f is this bound, right? So it's the same exact computation. All right, so let's look at the the middle bit. This is where this is where p sub r is big. Right when we're when when this uh, uh, you know when t over here is small and it's close to zero, this might be very big if r is close to one. Right, it's really the whole point. It should be. Uh, so so let's uh, uh, let's look at this. So again, same thing. We move it uh, uh, move the absolute values inside, and uh, uh, so now. Uh, we're using continuity. T is now small, right? So, uh, so we have that uh, that now we use the, the the fact that that this subtraction, that this f uh, part of it, is small, right? P sub r might be big, but this part of it is small, right? By using the uniform continuity, right? So, so we have because t is small, this thing is at most epsilon over two. That's that's uh, how we picked delta, right? Uh, so we bound that by epsilon over two. But uh, but now, um, if you if you look at it, um, it uh, um, 
if I'm integrating from minus delta to delta, a positive function, I might as well just integrate from minus pi to pi. That's going to give us something, uh, something possibly bigger, right? But uh, but actually, the integral from minus pi to pi of pr, no, you know, pr is now big, right? But it integrates to one, so so we get epsilon over two. Okay, so the two, right? We basically split it into really two pieces: the the minus delta, uh, the minus pi to minus delta, and the delta to pi is really one piece. And there, the Poisson kernel is small, uh, near t equals zero. Uh, the um, this part is small. The, the the f part is small, right? All right. So. If uh, if we have this uh, the R in this range, uh, this thing is well, uh, it was less than these three integrals, and we showed that uh, two of them are less than epsilon over four, one of them is less than epsilon over two, yeah, epsilon, right? So that means this is less than epsilon. Uh, so that means that uh, uniformly in theta, because this this uh, this delta prime did not depend on the theta. Uh, we have that uh, this thing, you know, that, that, that we have that pf of r e to i theta is going in, uh, to f of e to i theta as r goes to one. We're not quite done, right? We need uh, we need to show that we have um, if we're you know um, if we're some point on the boundary, some z naught on the boundary of the disk. Uh, that uh, no matter how we approach, not just not just along a ray, you know, for a fixed uh, uh, theta. Now the theta can also move, right? Uh, so, so we still need to show that that that, that still does work, right? Uh, so, so fix uh, some point on the boundary and and, uh, and some epsilon, and so we have uh, well, f is continuous. So that means that um, there is. Uh, some delta such that uh, uh, well, if, if if I'm within delta of uh, of theta naught, uh, I have uh, I'm, uh, at least on the boundary, I'm within epsilon over two. Right now, I could make delta possibly smaller. Uh, you know, I can make it as small as I want to. to uh, you know, now I'm going to use this thing, so. Uh, so that uh, for um, for all fixed theta or, or for all theta, sorry, uh, I I have this uh, this guy. So if I'm just moving along the ray, uh, that I'm within uh, uh, epsilon over two, right? Okay. So if z is r e to the i theta satisfies these two guys. Right, so it's it's within delta of one in terms of uh, in R and within delta of of uh, theta not uh, in the theta. Then we have that uh, the the difference of pf at z and pf at z not right. As well, I can split it up like this, and each one of these is epsilon over two. I get epsilon over two. Here's the, here's the picture, right? And this is z not. Right, and uh, you know, I can I can move delta this this direction and delta this direction, right? And I'm still within epsilon, right? Delta is small enough that that's still gonna be within epsilon. That's that's what we're proving, uh, which that that means that that pf is actually continuous at this point, right? Now we did use uh, polar coordinates rather than the you know the, the Cartesian coordinates. Right, but polar coordinates, except for the origin, and we're away from the origin. Uh, polar coordinates, you know, give you the same topology, right? So if you prove continuity uh, in polar coordinates, you've proved continuity in uh, um, in the, the the regular Cartesian coordinates, uh, right? Except that zero, it's not the same there. But uh, we're away from that. <laughs> we don't we don't care about the origin. So, all right. So that means that we have uh, 
uh, that we have continuity. And you can see that the continuity part is actually that was the trickier part. The the, the fact that it was harmonic was easy, right? That was just uh, that was just the fact that the uh, that the Poisson kernel is harmonic itself, right? It's the continuity that's that that requires uh, some tricky estimates. All right, and maybe not so tricky estimates, but requires something. Now, you could also just uh, translate and uh, rescale things. So you can you can do this at on any disk, um, you know, on any disk, uh, uh, delta R centered at P, some capital R, right? And if you just just work out what uh, what all of it is, uh, it's it's uh, you know it's this formula, right? This this integral, and you're using the same P, but now the scaling goes like this, right? And so this uh, we get on on any circle. If we get a any circle in the plane, if we have a, a continuous function on the circle, we can extend it to the inside continuously and harmonically inside, right? So it's a harmonic function inside; it's continuous up to the boundary. So we can solve the Dirichlet problem in any disk uh, in the uh, uh, in the plane. Now this means that that we're getting that we're representing uh, uh, harmonic functions, just like we can represent holomorphic functions uh, uh, using the Cauchy integral formula. If we have a, a function that's harmonic in in some some neighborhood, let's say, of of some disk, and uh, and we'll get p of that, uh, we solve the Dirichlet problem using the Poisson kernel, so the, the Poisson transform uh, here uh, of this function on the boundary, then we actually get uh, what we get back is our function, right? So it, uh, I can use it to represent a uh, uh, harmonic function based on their values on the boundary, right? So uh, if I want to know uh, what the harmonic function does inside, I just need to know what it does on the boundary, right? It's really just like uh, for holomorphic functions, which is expected of obviously because Harmonic functions just real parts of uh, holomorphic functions, at least locally, right? So, um, you know that should be true. Um, now, the Poisson kernel is is really specific to the disk. Um, you you have uh, you can define a, a a Poisson kernel on different domains, but you're gonna uh, it's 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 gonna look different, right? Uh, unlike the Cauchy kernel, where you're getting the kernel is always the same. Right, Cauchy kernel is always one minus uh, uh, zeta minus z. Right, it's basically what it is. Right, oh, one over two pi i. Right, <laughs> you want to put that inside the the kernel. All right. Now, a quick consequence of this uh, formula is that if I plug in, if if basically I uh, I instead of plugging in. Uh, you know, any point in the disk, let's just plug in P, right? So let's set little r to zero, right? If I set little r to zero, um, what we get, uh, this thing is just going to become, uh, uh, is going to go away, it's going to become one, right? So what I get is, is this, uh, this formula over here. Now, that says that at the center of the disk, uh, f is actually equal to its average on the boundary. This is called a mean value property, and that's actually, we're going to look uh, at that more in the next section, and actually the, the mean value property uh, is not only a property of harmonic functions, it defines harmonic functions. So another way of uh, uh, defining harmonic functions is saying that it's they are exactly the functions that satisfy this property that they're the average of its values around, right? So, all right. So we'll talk about that more once we get to it. Uh, now, the Poisson kernel we could, uh, if we wanted to use it instead of Cauchy kernel, we could, because uh, holomorphic functions are are harmonic. Well, I mean, the, the real and imaginary parts are harmonic, right? So if we define uh, what, what complex valued harmonic functions are, well, holomorphic functions are harmonic, right? Not vice versa, but uh, this way, this direction works. So if I plug a holomorphic function into the, uh, uh, into the formula, right, 
I'm going to get back that holomorphic function. It's, it's going to work uh, exactly the same because it's really, you know, uh, I'm really plugging the real and imaginary part, right? I mean, the, the Poisson kernel is real, right? So um, it only works in the real part separately and the imaginary part separately. And those are harmonic, so yeah, everything works. Now, however, uh, you, you know, if I plug in something different to the Cauchy formula and to the Poisson formula, um, I'm going to get some, you know, if it's not uh, something different by that, I mean something not holomorphic, uh, then I'm going to get something different. For example, suppose that F is the real part of Z, right? And I can think of that on the unit circle. So it's, oh, so that's, let's say twice the real part of Z. So Z plus Z bar for simplicity, right? So if I plug that into the Poisson formula, I mean, it's harmonic. So I'm just going to get Z plus Z bar inside, right? So if, if I'm just looking at Z plus Z bar on the boundary, I plug it into the Poisson formula, well, the obvious, uh, you know, solution of the Dirichlet uh, problem is Z plus Z bar inside, right? So that's what uh, the, the Poisson formula tells me. If I plug it into the Cauchy formula, if I integrate uh, against the Cauchy kernel, I actually get Z, right? So I will not get Z plus Z bar. Uh, and so I, I get something else. I, I mean, you can see that, that uh, uh, now it's not really reproducing the, you know, the, the Cauchy formula is not reproducing, and we know that that it's that it's not representing reproducing non-holomorphic functions, right? So, so yeah. So the formulas, if I plug in a holomorphic function to begin with, they're both going to give me the same thing. If I plug in something that's not holomorphic, they're going to give me something. Each one is going to give me something different. All right. Now a couple of exercises since we're. Uh, since we have these uh, formulas, so, so so a couple of neat formulas. Uh, so first, I mean, uh, you know, there's a uh, couple of ways to prove this. Now we've seen that uh, the solution of the Dirichlet problem on the uh, uh, on the um, upper half plane is not unique, uh, but if if we add, uh, you know, it, it it makes sense to if if we add some extra. Uh, conditions such as bounded. Uh, so, if we say we have a bounded function on the, I mean, it's, it's you know, in some sense, it always makes sense, but it's, you're not going to get a unique solution. Uh, but so let's suppose that we have a bounded function on um, uh, on the real line, say continuous, um, and then we define PF uh, uh, in this way on the upper half plane, on the closed upper half plane, then you will get something that's harmonic in the upper half plane and uh, and it's going to be continuous on uh, on the on the closure. So it's going to be continuous up to the real line, right? So that's the Poisson um, uh, formula for, um, for the upper half plane. Uh, then there's another uh, neat formula that, that follows, this actually follows fairly quickly from the from the Poisson formula, uh, and it's the Schwartz integral formula, which is which is for holomorphic functions. So if I have a holomorphic function, uh, but somehow I know only the real part of it on the boundary, right? I can actually recover what the function is. Well, up to up to an imaginary constant. So if I only know the the real part, then you know, and I only know the imaginary part up to a constant, right? So, so I have to know the imaginary uh, part at least at one point. So, so if I, uh, so, so basically that's what it is, right? It's, uh, uh, it's this, um, you know, I get this formula over here, uh, and which only looks at the real part of F, and then I'm adding. Uh, the imaginary part of, of f at zero. All right. So, all right. So next time uh, we're gonna look at uh, uh, we're gonna look at the the mean value property. So, uh, if I go back, okay, we're gonna look at this, uh, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna show that this this uh, uh, you know this characterizes the harmonic functions.
All right, cool. So talk to you next time.